Hey, it's me, Canada here. You are listening to the Trips and Global on Wheels podcast hour, the place to be to learn about the latest and greatest life stories from people who are doing amazing disability advocacy work. Today, we have the pleasure of welcoming Sylvia Juan, a secretariat from the International Disability Alliance. She shares about her wealth of experience in the international arena doing disability advocacy work globally. Now, let's listen in on my conversation with Ms. Sylvia Juan. Sylvia Juan, welcome to the Trapes and Global on Wheels podcast hour. Thank you very much. Very of happy course. to be here. Yes, yeah, so we are too. So for listeners who are not as familiar with you, I'm going to read a brief bio, okay? okay. So, so Sylvia Juan was born in Guatemala. Her academic qualifications include a pre-graduate degree in mathematics, a graduate degree in chemistry, postgraduate degree in social management and in gender studies, and a master's in human rights. Sylvia joined the International Disability Alliance Secretariat in July of 2017 and is leading the work of the Secretariat in relation with the UN treaty bodies in order to mainstream the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, CRPD, standards and facilitate the participation of disabled persons organizations in the work of the UN bodies, in particular the CRPD committee. Between 2011 and 2016, Sylvia served as an expert in the UN CRPD committee and served as vice chairperson during the last two years. Sylvia has been engaged in promoting the CRPD since its drafting by the UN ad hoc committee in 2003. Sylvia is based in Geneva. Thank you, Sylvia, welcome. Thank you very much. Very happy to be here. So we're going to kick off with the first question, okay? Yes. Um, With the first question, I want to ask you, can you share with us what your disability is and how that has informed your work today? I have a visual impairment. I'm totally blind ever since um, I was a young uh, woman. I uh, started because of that to seek um, what really was happening with my life um, around me. It was so difficult to be a young person, even an old teenage person, I would say, um, in a Guatemalan society, very conservative, in a very poor country where persons with disabilities were very stigmatized and discriminated against. Um, So I actually, um, after my, first university degree, which was very scientific, I decided that I needed to deepen my learning on social studies and on the situation of persons with disabilities in my country, Guatemala first, and then I expanded to Latin America. And uh, as as soon as I started increasing um, my contact with other persons with disabilities in my country and in the region, I also started my participation at international level in the ad hoc committee that drafted the UNCRPD, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So actually, being a blind person, when I started being a blind person in my late teens or young age, I was uh, very much uh, depressed and uh, thought that my life was about to end. Um, However, as soon as I uh, started learning about how other people were dealing with uh, their disabilities and how much had to be done for societies to change so that people with disabilities could be included. I joined that struggle and I started learning how to do it, um, how from my own uh, personal experience, but also by learning from other persons with disabilities, we we could join forces and struggle together to make better policies, a more inclusive society, and have people with disabilities be more participative of that process. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's great that, you know, with it's it's 
a sudden life change for anybody, but for you to be able to turn that around and also shift your academic and career path is um, very admirable. And so I know you grew up in Guatemala, as you were saying earlier. What are the biggest problems individuals with disability face in Guatemala? Um, yeah, and just share with us how that's different from what the struggles that they would face in the U.S. or in other parts of the world. Well, I think that social stigma and negative attitudes is still very prevailing in Guatemalan society. It's a very conservative society, a very religious influenced society where religious beliefs are very strong. And um, I think that worldwide uh, religion has played a very important role in the, the way that persons with disabilities have been treated throughout history. And um, I think that in Guatemala, that uh, prevailing beliefs, those prevailing beliefs are still very much influencing the way that people with disabilities are perceived in Guatemalan society, basically as, um, as, as burdens to society, to families, to communities, and uh, also very shameful um, families that uh, that in, that have a member with a disability usually think that it's uh, a shame that somebody with a disability should be part of that family and so you can see many people with disabilities being concealed from society by their family members or the other uh, solution is that they're usually abandoned and they're homeless or institutionalized um, policies for inclusion of persons with disabilities are not very well developed. I would say that since the CRPD um, was adopted by the UN General Assembly and since Guatemala ratified the CRPD in 2009, some things have changed. I would say that uh, uh, in the urban areas, maybe there is more awareness about persons with disabilities um, rights and uh, particularly the need and the right for them to be included in the society. However, uh, I would say Guatemalan society is still far behind from the U.S., as you had asked before. The U.S. has a long history of people with disabilities struggling for the rights. Um, I would say um, also supported by other social movements in the U.S. Um, in, back in the 60s and the 70s. And um, this is uh, around the time when the independent living movement in, in the U.S. Um, was also created. And I think that launched a series of revolutionary changes in the U.S. and how people with disabilities have had the ADA, for example, in 1990. And that's a certainly changed uh, the lives of many people with disabilities in the U.S. I know that the U.S. Uh, is still not perfect. Many people with disabilities are still struggling for other, um, for many of the rights to be complied with. But I would say that Guatemala is still much, much far behind. I see, and I, I do see some themes with other countries, especially in the global south and in the Asia region as well, where there's that negative stigma and there's that, you know, you're talking earlier of being, you know, ab ab abandoning these kinds of um, children. So, how is I know you've done a lot of work with disability rights globally. So how is disability advocacy at a global level different from disability advocacy at a more uh, domestic level and tackling just one country versus pushing the whole global movement forward in the area of disability rights? Um, that is a very good question. Of course, the scope of the struggle at international level is, I would say, quite different from the struggle that can be uh, undertaken by persons with disabilities at domestic level in a small country or in a big country, depending on the context. Um, at the international level, I think that um, the, the, the goal to improve 
the way that the human rights standards have been developing to include the rights of persons with disability is the major challenge still. Even with CRPD uh, being in force since uh, 2008 at international level, um, still many human rights experts and human rights uh, agencies at the UN level, for example, are not fully compliant with CRPD. They are still um, uh, very resistant, I would say, um, to the major changes that the CRPD has brought into the international human rights uh, standards and interpretation. Um, however, at domestic level, in many of the countries in the global south, I would say, people are still struggling to have the basic needs being covered. So we're talking about um, many people with disabilities still not having um, minimal standards of living being covered or access to social, economic and cultural rights like access to health and education, basic, very basic needs, or even if we want to say to the most basic, to housing and food and water. Um, this at the international level is not so controversial. I mean, at international level, I think there is clarity that persons with disabilities, of course, have a right to all these uh, very basic and fundamental rights um, to housing, to water, sanitation, and to access to health um, and to education. The controversy at international level is how to interpret the compliance of these rights. There is a big debate, for example, on what education or the right to education of persons with disabilities really means. Is this segregated education or inclusive education? Whilst at domestic level in the very poorest countries at the global south, there's not even segregated education being put into place. So, so of course, there is a big gap between at, uh, what is being discussed at international level and what is happening, I would say, in the day to day of persons with disabilities in the global south. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Those are very good points. So now I'm curious about what motivates you to keep pushing for, forward with disability rights work? I know that you've done a tremendous amount of work and you're very well con connected in this community as well at the global level. So what inspires you and what empowers you to keep pushing forward and to keep thinking that tomorrow or the next year or the next decade will be better? Well, um, many things, of course. Um, I've had the opportunity to visit many countries and seen what the situation of persons with disability uh, is and what the, are the major challenges that they face um, in, in many countries, both at, in the global south, starting of, uh, with my own country, of course, Guatemala, um, but also uh, visited uh, countries, mo the most developed countries and seen that even though um, it might look like people with disabilities have many of their of their needs uh, taken care of by, by policies and good legislation, um, they still face many challenges for the full compliance of the, disability, the, the rights of persons with disabilities. So what really um, is encouraging or what really uh, motors me up uh, to continue uh, this my work and, uh, and and struggling for a better uh, world, if you can say, is that still you can see that many, many people with disabilities don't have even their basics um, uh, to live decently and with dignity. It doesn't mean that I'm saying that people with disabilities do not have dignity. It, I'm just saying that um, many situations that they face, many absences, being denied their rights constantly every day, day to day in every situation is really um, a, 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 a most um, undignified uh, way of being treated by societies and by governments. I think that still governments 
around the world and societies have a very big um, debt to persons with disabilities. Uh, they need to, to cover um, many of these issues that have been, I would say, taken care of for other excluded populations. I would say, for instance, for women, um, even for children, uh, women without disabilities, children uh, without disabilities. However, persons with disabilities are still far behind um, in most of the scenarios and at, at, at every level of life. Um, I'm talking of uh, civil and political rights and also social, economic and cultural rights. Um, and still, um, what efforts are being taken by governments to improve the rights of persons with disabilities are still very minimal. So people with disabilities still have a long way um, to fulfill their rights. And I think that uh, more people should join this struggle. So that's really what motivates me. I see that there's still so much to be done and that even though we, we work so hard, we struggle so hard, very um, little has been advancing. And why do you think that is? Why is the progress so painstakingly slow? I think it has uh, various um, reasons. I cannot give just one answer to that question. I think it has to do that uh, with how the world has been moving um, throughout history. And um, there is a, a strong uh, movement that values ableism and, and that has been uh, becoming stronger and stronger. So able-bodied people are valued because they're able-bodied, because they can do things, because they're considered more valuable for capitalism. They're more valuable for the work, uh, for, for the, uh, as part of the workforce. While disabled people are useless. And so um, it, it, this, uh, I would say this um, very fundamental idea that most people have, because of course there are some few that don't think like that, but I would say um, basically um, uh, those that move the world, I'm saying the powers of the world, have that idea. So it, it's really not worth it for them to invest on having the rights of persons with disabilities being fulfilled for it. It is too costly, um, it takes too long, and anyways, people with disabilities are not, um, are not, are not going to be uh, good enough to join that workforce that they want so much to have, that they want to be increased. So I would say that is one reason, but of course, I would say that stigma, um, of course, this uh, ableism is has its root causes in stigma. I think those are very important points, yeah, with ableism, with stigma, with people's attitudes. So with all of these things going on in the stigma and the attitude and the ableism, um, but despite all of that, you've done some amazing work, and I'm curious about what are your proudest achievements so far towards progressing the global disability rights movement in the span of your career? Oh, <laughs> um, I think that um, that for me person personally, um, having uh, been elected. As, a, as an expert into the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is one of my major achievements. Um, I think that uh, for human rights defenders, as I consider myself to be one, really want to take their work into the international um, arena, into the UN system, and that is of course one of the, the I would say the most paradigmatic um, organs within the UN system that struggle for advancements into the rights of persons with disabilities. So being a member of the committee has been for me mm, a, an, an incredible achievement uh, for me personally, but also for those people who are part of my closer environment, because we have all been together in this. 
Um, but because I think that the work that the CRPV committee has been doing so far has been really amazing. Um, and it's not only because I was part of, of that committee, because the committee continues doing amazing work. Um, and of course, it has developed standards for governments and also for uh, societies, organizations of persons with disabilities to follow into their work. So in a way, it's like a light that um, guides governments and um, civil society to follow. So um, personally, I'm very proud of, of, of been being have been part of that committee and I still um, follow it very closely and um, try to collaborate in any way. Being a former member, I am somehow connected to the committee still. And of course, through my work with the International Disability Alliance, I work directly with organizations of persons with disabilities that somehow liaise with the committee. And, um, and, and uh, I think that uh, while I still keep doing that, um, I feel that uh, that I'm contributing um, in some way to advancing the rights of persons with disabilities at global level. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you're definitely doing some fabulous work. So along those same lines, what progress have you seen in the last decade that you are especially proud of in the in the global disability rights movement? I think that there is one. Um, uh, not one, but one topic that the CRPD committee has significantly contributed to with, of course, with the CRPD in the first place, the text of the convention um, does define multiple discrimination as a form of, of discrimination against persons with disabilities. So it is the first um, human rights treaty in the UN system that includes the explicit reference to multiple discrimination in his text. And, and the CRPD committee has gone further beyond not only uh, mentioning and referring to multiple discrimination, but also to intersectional discrimination and developing standards around intersectional discrimination. I think this has been a, a very powerful contribution to um, how, how um, human rights have been um, have been developing, how they have been, how the interpretation of human rights has been developing um, at international level. And um, I think one of the major advancements was general comment number three by the CRPD committee that deals with women and girls with disabilities. So it does deal, um, it is the first general comment uh, that was adopted by the CRPD committee where multiple and intersectional discrimination was uh, thoroughly defined and described. And I think this does provide um, many states, many governments, and especially persons with disabilities, um, a better understanding of what this really means and how this can be translated into um, identifying these multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination in daily life of persons with disabilities at local and national level. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's wonderful. And so my next question is regarding the UNCRPD, which you've done a lot of work with. So in your opinion, what has been the most compelling and tangible achievement of the UNCRPD? I think that the major achievement of the CRPD was changing the paradigm from the older models of, of disability, basically the medical model, model of disability into the human rights model of disability. And I think that um, even though it, it might sound too repetitive, because people usually say many times that the CRPD does um, uh, promote this human rights model of disabilities, still many people, still many governments do not really um, understand I'm not sure if understand is the correct term uh, to say that they don't really uh, move into the shift. They do not shift really, but they still uh, think that the medical model is okay. And um, 
and and they will say that they are complying with the with the CRPD and that they have shifted into the human rights model. But when you examine what they're doing um, in their governments, you see that the medical model is still very prevailing. Um, so I would say the major contribution, of course, is the shift in the way that people with disabilities are uh, perceived as, but also how governments and states should move uh, into changing policies, into changing uh, programs, into changing the way of thinking people with disabilities. Although it is a major milestone, the CRPD is unique in this way, um, its compliance is still, I would say, um, the big challenging issue worldwide still. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate, you know, that the U.S. is not part of has not signed on to it. Mm -hmm. I think that's I think that is definitely not setting in a good example for the world. So moving on to I know you do speaking engagements as well, right? So so I see that you've you've been a speaker in conferences throughout Latin America and the Caribbean, North America, and Europe. So what is your best advice for public speaking uh, when getting the message across um, for advocacy, dignity, respect, and e equal opportunity for people with disabilities? I think that um, we should really um, put into practice this our, our slogan, nothing about us without us. I feel that um, still many people who are not disabled are speaking out for people with disabilities. And I have seen this also in conferences, as you mentioned, um, in international events, um, even hosted by the UN, that still many non-disabled people are speaking out. Mm, and, and I'm not saying that they're not doing it right. It's just that I think that these should be spaces these should be um, um, speeches, not only speeches, but uh, they should be the 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 main the main um, uh, role player in all the activities and uh, movements to move to to advance with the rights of persons with disabilities should be led by persons with disabilities themselves, and and I notice it. Uh, personally, when I attend any of these conferences, events, and so on, that it is you, you feel the environment, you see how people respond when a person with a disability is the person talking, or when it is a person without a disability who's doing the talking. You see how people respond. It's very, very different. And of course, our message is much stronger if we ourselves deliver it and not let other people talk for ourselves, which is... Um, which is what our this slogan about nothing without us with uh, about us without us means. So um, I do think also that uh, people with disabilities should not allow this to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with you. So we've come to our last question. Thinking into the future, what are the biggest challenges you foresee for the future population of those living with a disability? And how can we overcome these challenges? Oh, that is a complicated question. <laughs> the near future. <clears throat> um, when, when you see what's happening all over the world, and I'm talking in general, not only for persons with disabilities, it is a bit um, depressing um, to see that um, um, there is still so much inequality. Um, there's still so much injustice, unfairness. Um, and um, many times this inequality, this unfairness is provoked by um, by these uh, um, global struggles uh, between countries and regions or between religions um, or because uh, people or, or I would say powers are very greedy and they want all the, all the material resources that they can get. So you see that, um, um, that the near future is uh, not, would not present a context where people with disabilities can actually 
um, develop if you see it globally. However, I think that um, uh, even though a global level is very important, we also have to focus at domestic level. Domestic level is how people with disabilities in a day to day can change things. Mm-hmm. Great points there, Sylvia. Um, I think, you know, whether it's at the global level or at the domestic level, people need to take up, take action, step up and get out of their comfort zones, especially those living with a disability who um, have the resources and to to voice their opinions. And I think with the development of uh, modern technology um, is easier and easier to go online and voice your opinions and share your perspectives on the different different issue areas. And uh, Sylvia, so that's the that's the end of our interview. Thank you so much for for being generous with your time. You're very welcome. I'm I'm uh, very happy that I could finally join. Um, it, it was a difficulty of timing, not of will, <laughs> but uh, I'm very happy, uh, and I really look forward to also um, hearing back from people who can, uh, hear and watch this interview. Um, so any comments, um, anything that, uh, that, uh, people like me who work at the global level can improve, just, just, uh, let us know because it is important for us also to hear from people with disabilities, what they, their challenges are, fa- what they face day to day. Thank you. Now, Sylvia and I would love to hear from you. What advice do you have for us in pushing the international disability rights movement forward? How can we help you stay more connected with people who are doing disability advocacy work in other parts of the world? Did you like this video? If so, share with your friends and be sure to follow us on social media. And if you want even more resources, be sure to sign up for our email updates on our website, traipsingglobal.com. Keep learning new perspectives, Keep being inclusive because it will make the world a better place for you and for everyone else. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you on another episode of the Trips and Global on Wheels podcast hour.